Danny Minogue is one of the most famous people in the country. I'm talking to someone who has straddled four decades of fame. There's a person that people think you are and then there's a the real person. Today is a really good opportunity to sit with Piers and get him to find out who the real person is. Danny has never done a full sit-down interview about her life before and I doubt she will again. This is the first time I've gone through everything from start till now. Ah. <laughs>I don't know, but I'm very glad you have. Kind of strange. Really strange. Danielle Jane Minogue. Here's the most amazing thing about you. I'm looking at you now, looking radiant, youthful, all those sort of things. You've been in show business for four decades, haven't you? Isn't that weird? Yeah, it is. It is strange because you never um, really look back and I've just fumbled from one thing into the next and... Had a great time doing it, but um, I, when I started, I never thought that it would turn into a career. So to be sitting here tonight is quite astonishing. <laughs> I mean, when you look back over all that you've been through, good, bad, ugly, and it's been tough for you at times, do you ever think, if I had my chance again, I wouldn't go down the route of fame? I never wanted to go for the fame thing. The work side of it I like. I have a good work ethic and I like learning things and being with creative people. And um, I just thought if I had the chance to do that, I would. But I don't think there's anybody who's been in show business for as many decades who hasn't had ups and downs. It's never going to be a steady climb to the top. And it's probably the times when you kind of fall and stumble that are the most important parts that are shaping you at who you are. I mean, the nice thing about your career path is that a lot of child stars, and you were huge in Australia at the age of nine, a lot of child stars, most of them, in fact, just disappear, and they're traumatised by the whole experience. And, you know, we've all seen the, the wreckage of these kind of people. Mm. But you've actually reached a place now where you're probably as successful and famous as, he's ever, as you've ever been, and yet we're talking, you know, 30 years nearly after you started. I know. It's weird, isn't it? It's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it. I'm, I'm, I'm the one out of everyone who can't believe it. I mean, there's a lot of um, critics that said, what does she do and why is she still around? But honestly, I'm the one who's more surprised than anyone. Are you? Because they've always struck me when I've looked at you that you're a tough cookie. I'm not, though. That's, must be a that's bit, a big, aren't you? big misconception. I'm a big, I'm a big softy, and um, I guess I'm, I have a strength um, at dealing with getting through ups and downs, but I'm, not, I'm definitely not a tough cookie. Right, let's cut to the quick. Right now, you are starring... I love it when he does this. You are starring <laughs> in X Factor, which... This series has exploded. It is oh. like a real-life soap opera. It's incredible. It's like the best thing that's happened to me. But at times it's been really tough and character-building. And it's, you know, it's mad and I wouldn't have it any other way. I kind of, um, I guess I ended up in this career because I like the circus of people that surround you when you're in anything to do with entertainment, whether it's in the theatre or, or on a show like that, there's a, there's a weird mix of people. How vile is Simon Cowell to work for? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> well, I know how vile he is. I want to on hear you say it. I tell you, you have to start with a compliment. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have to say that, in a way, he's changed my life around because of of giving me this opportunity. He's tough to work for, he should be. You know, he's got a lot of uh, people that he's responsible for. If the show works, it's generating so many jobs and careers, it's earning him a lot of money, <laughs> more <laughs> money. Um, he's an incredible guy and 
the thing that I like is kind of picking his brain for the production of the show. Well, never mind all that. What about the negative side? <laughs> the negative side? He loves himself. <laughs> his ego is almost as large as yours. <laughs> I mean, he also has, I'm told, transformed his dressing room. Now, we share, for the live shows, at the same studios at Fountain yeah. at Wembley. And when I was there, it was huge. But I'm told he now has his own floor upstairs, yes. and he's now got cowhide wall, which he spent 20000 on, and has a bubble bath. Is that right? Yeah. I don't know how much I'm allowed to say, but... Oh, all of it, all of it. It's, um, <laughs> it's beautifully done. It's like James Bond room. It's like leather panelling. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a bath, and it's like a hotel. There's a bath, and at the end of the bath, there's a TV screen. He said, that's where I'll be watching the dress run from. <laughs> OK. And so uh, before the first show, I, I bought him a rubber duck. <laughs> and do you, do you lie in the bath with him watching the run-throughs? Or... Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> is it fun, X Factor, or is it so nerve-wracking because of the sheer size of the show, the number of viewers watching? I mean, can you have a laugh now, or is it too intense? I think the intensity is what we're all doing, like working with all of the different departments. And I personally get wrapped up in the contestants and wanting to know, do they feel OK when they go out there? You n I don't think you can be aware that half the country's watching, otherwise you'll completely freeze up. I mean, it is much harder, I think, for you girls, isn't it? Because the amount of scrutiny that you get, how your hair looks, your dress, the comparison with... Cheryl, all that kind of thing. It seems to be. I don't know why it's that way, because you speak to a lot of women and they go, why, why do you have to be pegged up against anyone else? You're just on the show doing what you're doing. But I'm sure when you're working with Simon, a little bit they peg, peg you against each other, but it's more intellectually. It's not about your nail polish or anything else, how pretty you are. Do you feel the pressure? about how you look? Do you feel every show you've got to come up with some dazzling new look? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, you know, I watch television too and, you know, I remember tuning into every, say, Sex in the City or whatever and you're dying to see what they're wearing and that's a girl thing and I don't know why we do it, but we do. I mean, some people criticise these shows and say they just go for the eye candy. They get you and Cheryl in, Amanda, whoever it is, because people want to look at a pretty face. Do you agree with that? Does it matter? Do you think that television should be about I'll youth and glamour? I'll take a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's entertainment and it's got to be fun and it's got to be fabulous and it's got to be eccentric sexy. and at times sexy. It's got to be a bit of everything. I mean, X Factor you've got from the young kids to an older panel, you've got all of the madness going on in between. It's got to be everything. That's what people tune in for. I mean, and be, be honest, when you wake up in the morning after a big live show and the papers do one of their, you know, who looked hotter <laughs> charts, you know, and it says, oh, Danny blew Cheryl out of the water last night. Do you feel a little like, oh, yes? You give it a little F1, yes! <laughs> <laughs> thing is, you know, I spent so many years uh, reading headlines that I was the kind of the fat, ugly sister. You kind of do get a little bit of joy out of going, oh, I look good? OK. I don't want to be pegged up against Cheryl, and I love Cheryl, and she looks gorgeous. That just happens, but it's nice if someone says you look good. Every girl likes that. I mean, conversely, if the, if the chart says... Cheryl looked great last night. And Danny, a little bit rough. <laughs> that, I mean, is that literally no breakfast, no lunch, down the gym? <laughs> Call the stylist. Check the stylist. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I mean, you don't read into it too much. It's just, it's fun. I like the fashion element of it. So, Danny, although people think that it was Kylie that was first off the showbiz starting block, in fact, it was you, wasn't it? Yeah, I bet you've got really bad old footage yeah. now. <laughs> From an early age, Danny and her older sister Kylie have had a healthy showbiz rivalry. Dan was the first one to really take off in music on the TV show Young Talent Time, which was huge at the time. Every family was tuning in. 
Danny was the main star of Australian variety show Young Talent Time, leaving Big Sister to watch and learn. You don't need- Danny was on television every week and she was one of the biggest household names in Australia. Danny was TV royalty. Everyone wanted to be her. All the boys fancied her. All the girls, you know, aspired to look like her. She was the one. And we actually did a segment on Young Talent Time where Danny introduces her sister Kylie. You're not laying any guilt trips on me. I make my own decisions. Always so dramatic. Danny's decision to leave the show after seven years to pursue an acting career left the nation reeling. Both Danny and Kylie wanted to make it big in Britain, but it was Kylie who exploded first, thanks to her role as Charlene in Aussie Soap Neighbours. I knew more of Kylie with the, the records that she had out in the charts and everything, and I probably shouldn't admit to this, but I used to watch my neighbours. There's always been this idea in the British press that Kylie, if they were a record, Kylie was the A side and Danny was the B side. Kylie's on screen success was the launch pad for her musical career, putting her firmly into Danny's territory. Danny had lots of top ten records, but Kylie had lots of number one records. But then in 2007, Danny landed a role as a judge on The X Factor. And the rest, as they say, is history. I think the British public have finally been able to get to know somebody um, who maybe before they just didn't really have the chance to know. She's totally stepped out of Kylie's shadow. I couldn't do it. I really could not. I'd fall to pieces. I'd be too flustered. Danny and Kylie both from Down Under, but Danny was the one who was seen as Down and Under, but not anymore. I mean, you're bigger than Kylie now, aren't you? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> A little part of you thinks so, come on. There's got to be that sisterly rivalry. There's not. There is absolutely no rivalry between us unless we're on a Scrabble board. (laughs) Then I kick her ass. (laughs) Does it feel nice to come out of Kylie's shadow a little bit? I don't wake up and compare myself to her every day, but there's a lot of times when I just thought, maybe I'm not any good at any of this, but I'm being given opportunities and I'm having a great time doing what I'm doing. And when I just focus on that, it's fun. Have you and ever been jealous of her, to be no. honest? No. Never? No. She was better at bowling at one stage. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. She was, a, she was a 10-pin bowling champ and she came back with all of these awards <laughs> and stuff. And you, do, you look up to your big sister and you think, you know, maybe one day I'll be good at doing things, but I, I really don't compare us. Who's the better singer? Uh... <laughs> Right now, I would say Kylie. <laughs> right now. Right now. And if you both came on X Factor mm. as separate contestants... <laughs> <laughs> well, come on, it's the business. I mean, I, who do you think would do better? I think she'd kick my ass. <laughs> <laughs> Were you always concerned with the truth? Yes, I was, young lady. <laughs> truth or headlines? I was always... Well... First of all... (laughs) If you don't speak to us, we have it on good authority that you're HIV positive when we're running the headline. (laughs) The press you've had has at times bordered on really unpleasant. I mean... Mm. Vicious. Some of the most vicious press coverage I've read about any celebrity. And we're in an age when... You were part of that, my friend. (laughs) (laughs) Very much got past. I love it when you say the press were were vicious 
back to you. Uh, the, the ghastly hello. tabloids. I mean, never left you alone, did, did we? Uh, <laughs> how bad did it get for you, reading this stuff? Um, yeah, some days were a shocker, I can tell you that much. Um, it's hard, you know, not only do you read it, but um, the thing that was upsetting was that, you know, my parents were reading it. And the person who probably gets most upset about it is my sister. And what kind of thing do you, the family, find most upsetting, would you say? Just stuff that's not true. And it's, it, it's been at times hard to defend yourself or you answer the same question over and over and over and over again and nobody believes you. I can only answer the question and be honest with it. Um, I think a lot has changed. Like these days, you've got things like your blog and your Twitter, and I think celebrities have a much more kind of immediate response to stuff that's out there. And I find that even in, in articles, um, journalists are picking up what we're writing on the Twitter and actually using that to create the articles rather than at sometimes it felt like, oh, someone must be paid to just sit down at a keyboard and have to think something up. Because I just didn't know where these stories came from. But you'd know, you'd know <laughs> how they ha happen. Is <laughs> well, it just I'm, what I'm you a... want to write or is it what people want to hear? I think you'd be horrified probably by what really used to go on. Certainly when I worked in papers... A lot of celebrities lie. A lot of celebrities get people to lie for them. They're lawyers, yeah. they're agents, they're managers. Yeah. It is a nest of vipers. And trying to work out where the truth lies sometimes, if you're the newspaper, I don't want to defend all they do, because I know sometimes they go to the Are top. Are you always concerned with the truth? Yes, I was, young lady. Truth or headlines? I was always, well, first of all... <laughs> I mean, what was the worst thing that happened to you with the press, would you say? It's been a lot of things. There's been a lot of little twists and turns and, and, and ups and downs. And uh, the worst one is actually something quite shocking. And it wasn't something that was ever printed, but a situation that... I found myself in, um, there were, it, it's so weird, this story, so I don't even know where to start or end with it and it's probably not going to come out making any sense because I haven't spoken about this. So I, um, at my apartment building where I live, um, a bunch of flowers arrives to be delivered to me. And the person with the flowers was trying to come to my apartment and the security said, no, you can leave them here, that's it. Uh, they return again with the flowers. The flowers now have a, a letter written, which I have and will always keep, um, from a journalist. They clearly say, this is who I am and there's a card in there and I'm from this major newspaper. And we've tried to contact you to speak to you and with no luck. And if you don't speak to us, we have it on good authority that you're HIV positive when we're running the headline. I just don't... Couldn't even work out. I had to read this letter so many times. I'm on my own in my apartment just thinking, is this... Is this a joke? But it had the card in there from the journalist and the paper and... I was just so scared and so confused about what to do. When you're a celebrity, you're in the public eye, there's no manual for what to do in that situation. Look up page 84. What do I do when? Um, and so I called management and... I spoke to my family and I'm just like, what do you do in this situation? And this was um, all pre-blogs and Twitters and stuff where you could be right on it and 
have your say. And I just thought, I don't know why someone would be kind of not out, even out to get me, but on my case about something like this. I had been working for an AIDS charity, Terence Higgins Trust. Not many people want to be involved in a charity like that because they want to be involved with the cuddly nice charities. And this is kind of heavy real life stuff. So I'm reading the letter thinking, um, is it because of that that someone sent me this letter? And I don't even know how I got around to making the decision, but there were many phone calls and I actually thought there's only one way to stop this. And it was just the weirdest thing. Drove down to my doctor's office, sat there, put my arm out and said, I need this test done immediately. And all I could do was have this piece of paper slapped on their desk to say, no, I'm not HIV positive. There is no story. And it quickly and quietly went away, which I didn't want to have to go through that. How many times does anyone have to give blood to prove some accusation? It was just weird. And I'm shaking talking about it because... It's just, I don't understand why someone would do that. And I'm proud of the work that I've done with the Terence Higgins Trust. I love the people that I work with there. I love the things that we've managed to achieve and I will continue working with them, even if it means being in the firing line. But I have that journalist name and I have the letter. How long did it take you to get over it, do you think? A long time. I just thought, how could I be so stupid in every respect? Do you regret doing Playboy now? No, I don't. Doing the actual shoot was quite liberating and quite fun. I actually looked at the pictures and I thought, damn, I look all right. You have had an extraordinary life. I mean, you were famous before you were 10. For those who obviously aren't Australian, how big were you? Um, It was as big as being a star on X Factor today, but instead of being on it for 10 weeks and then walking away and winning the show, you you grew up on that show, so I, I did that for six years. So this, that was a, was, this was, just to explain, this was a show called Young Talent Time. Which one are you? Bottom left. <laughs> are you precocious? Bossy little madam? Or? Um, I would stand up for myself. I was no pushover. One of the guys in the... Um, he's not in that picture. But uh, we're very, very good friends now, but he used to really annoy me all the time. He was completely hyperactive. And one day he was just doing my head in when I said just stop it now just really stop it because it's enough so of course he had one more go and I don't know what happened my arm came out and I just went boom and I watched him and he fell over and I thought I don't even know that I could do that never messed with me again I tell you by 1989 Kylie is a smash hit in Neighbours and you pop up in the rival soap, Home and Away. What was the thinking behind that? Because you are putting yourself right up against your big sister. I left Young Talent Time. That had been my whole childhood. Didn't really know what I was going to do, but I thought I'll stay at school and study, and I quite fancied being a director. And then they said, oh, there's a chance that, you know, being on this soap opera, and I thought great experience, you know, considering what I want to do and get out and try something new, learn, learn some new skills. I mean, what was 
fascinating about Home and Away and Neighbours was that the stars of these shows in Australia probably thought, oh, we're pretty well known in our own country. Meanwhile, in Britain, they're becoming absolutely huge hits. Did you have any real idea that was going on? We had no concept when we were in the studio making the show of how big it was in the UK, how it took over, how people cut school to run home and watch them. Um, the only time I realised that there was... This market was very important for the show. Um, we filmed uh, Home and Away, we filmed on a beach, which is Summer Bay, and then there's the studio stuff. And uh, we do actually have winters in Australia, so you rock up to work at 7am, um, you find yourself there in a bikini walking down the beach, delivering these lines, there's rain hitting your face, but it just doesn't show up on camera. And I remember going up to the producer saying, would it be possible that maybe we could have some costumes um, in winter that were a little warmer? And uh, the answer came back, no. It is always summer in Summer Bay. <laughs> Did you like being a pop star? Because you were actually incredibly successful, despite all the people that sneer at you now about your pop career. If you actually look at the number of hits you had, you were successful. Loved it. I've always loved music. I've always loved being a part of it. And whether I'm mentoring the kids on X Factor or doing it myself, I love it. I just love to be around it all the time. You've tasted fame. You're having a great, successful pop career as well. But the one thing missing from your life is a man. With her early showbiz career leaving no time for romance, when Danny did fall in love, she fell hard. The fellow actor Julian McMahon, the son of an ex-prime minister. At the time, it was like the most glamorous thing in the world. It was gorgeous, you know, she looked stunning. He was so handsome. Kylie was a bridesmaid. It was beautiful. When she uh, decided to marry the son of a former prime minister, I was a bit concerned about that. God, was I there. I was invited. It was one of the weirdest weddings I'd, I'd ever been to. It was the first real bit of Australian aristocracy I've seen. It was really ugly. And it wasn't long before the newspapers were put in the boot in. The backlash in the Australian press, certain amount side of the press, was really horrible. And they just thought, oh, pop star marrying Prime Minister's son, that it, was, it could never work. It had failure all over it. Having lived under an ever-present media spotlight, it came as no surprise when the couple's marriage fell apart after just 17 months. The fairy tale was over. She just broke down, and it was really, really hard to see that because I thought she was doing okay. And you suddenly think, oh, wow, you know, this, she's just like everyone else. But rather than let it crush her, Danny made the decision to shed more than just her tears. <laughs> She just got divorced and I think her self-esteem was limbo low. So I understand what she was doing. She was just trying to, to reclaim her, her sexuality and trying to, you know, build herself up in, in the public eye. You know, for me it's always difficult when I see children that grew up with me who become sort of like my, my own children in, in a way, do something that I'd rather they didn't. In reflection now, I don't see any problem with it. I just couldn't look at it, that's all. Playboy was, you know, two fingers up to him. And, like, this is what you're missing. Is that what it was? Was it two fingers up? It... In the end, it was... I guess it did lift me up, but the reason I didn't wasn't to stick two fingers up at Julian at all. Um, when we got married, he wanted to get started in America. I was working in London and I'm flying between the two to try and see him. And at the point that we divorced, I was 150 grand in debt. I had worked my whole entire life. I'd earned a lot of money over a long period of time. To be that in debt where you 
cannot pay your rent, on top of the devastation of this marriage didn't work out and I really thought it was going to. I love this person. Ever since then until now, it's felt like this big, dark secret of why I did Playboy and everybody wagged the finger and what a stupid thing to do because I never, ever wanted to admit the trouble that I was in and I never wanted anyone to think badly of Julian. I should have been looking at the finances more, got in big, big trouble. It's kind of nice now to say, okay, it did look like the most stupid thing to do, but I had no other choice and I would never, ever ask my family for money. So I I remember having the contract there and my parents there, and, and like Johnny Young, my parents did not want me to do this. My dad's standing there going, when you do this, that's forever. You can never, ever change that. And I said, Dad, I don't have any other choice. Sign the bottom of the contract. Thankfully, the upside was it actually was fun and I did feel liberated by it and and at the end, it probably kind of dug me out of a hole, not just financially, but I did get a bit of self-esteem back. I just thought, how could I be so stupid in every respect? How could I have not seen this com- coming with the, the, the marriage not working out? Everyone else could see it. How could I let everything turn into this? when I should know better. You know, I've worked really hard all my life. When you were... (laughs) Do you regret doing Playboy now? Do you wish that it wasn't on the CV that you did it? No, I don't. I don't, but I feel more relieved now that people know why I did it. And I actually looked at the pictures and I thought, damn, I look all right. (laughs) Um, And the the magazine came out. It was the biggest selling Playboy they'd ever, ever had. Apparently it sold out in three days. They had to reprint. (laughs) (laughs) And the biggest compliment was... um, girlfriends of mine had gone out to buy it because they'd know me. They'd gone out to, to, to purchase to see what it was all about. They realised they're very tasteful shots and called me up and said, you know what, you look beautiful. And it was, it, then it felt like a celebration of me, at, only at that point. When you met Julian, you were obviously in love with the guy. I mean, what was it that attracted you to him? He was a wild guy, you know, he liked having fun and being a bit crazy and goofy and having a laugh and, you know, we enjoyed each other's friends and I, for me I thought that's, that's all you want out of a relationship at that stage. How long did it take you to get over it, do you think? A long time. I felt kind of uncomfortable and scared that I did not want to get myself into that same situation. It wasn't about not trusting other people and, oh, I don't want a boyfriend because I won't trust him. I didn't trust me. I didn't trust my instincts anymore. You know, I didn't want to be alone, but I certainly thought that being alone was better than messing it up again. Ironically... Julian goes on to star in the American TV series Nip Tuck about plastic surgery and you go under the knife yourself. They're good, aren't they? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. When you'd had your enhancement, um, how did you feel? When you came out and you suddenly had these whoppers. Knockers. 
fantastic. I think it was what I needed at that time. Any other scalpel work that we should be aware of? Or... We do a bit of tweaks and turns, but you know. What kind of what kind of tweaks are we looking at here? I'm not going to go into <laughs> it, but you know. See, one thing I'm quite surprised about is that you're frowning. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I thought you were the queen of Botox. I was. I was at one stage. I was the one pegged out as the one having more Botox than anyone, which was very funny sitting next to Sharon Osbourne. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't spoken to my sister yet. I can't speak to anyone before I speak to her. That's insane. <laughs> It's now 2005, you're having a lot of success, you're doing all the clubs, Kylie's career was going great guns as well, yeah. and then right when things are going really well for both of you, something very, very difficult happens. When it was announced that her sister Kylie was seriously ill, the news sent shockwaves around the world. Messages of support have been flooding in tonight for the pop star Kylie Minogue, who announced today that she has breast cancer. When the illness broke, it really was that sense that the whole nation felt like they owned this story. Danny was besieged with questions about her sister. All your feelings about your sister's illness is sort of on the front page of the newspapers. It was an endless questions, 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 questions. How is Kylie? You know, is she OK? What, you know, what, how are you feeling? And it wasn't the first time the disease had had an impact on Danny's life. She lost a really good friend um, to cancer. I, myself, being Danny's friend, was also ill with cancer around the same time. It was like everyone around her dad was ill at one stage. with the same. It just seemed like everywhere she turned, there was cancer. She found it hard to even speak about for a long time. And she couldn't let any of her emotions show through because she, she, they needed her strength. And that was the most difficult time of her life. For years, the demands of their careers meant the pair had drifted apart. But Kylie's condition helped bring the sisters closer together again. She goes into protective mode and she, she's like a mother hen. In fact, we, call, we sometimes call her Nana. She'd hate me saying that. Nearly every Friday afternoon, she'd go on the Eurostar to Paris with her little you know, wheelie bag. It was like a pet. We used to call it her dog and stroke it. And she'd be running off. She was incredible when I was ill and would come and put the iPod on and try to get me up and dancing. She was never going to accept Kylie not being here. We've become so much closer over the last few years. We're making up for lost time now and I just we couldn't be closer and I'm absolutely so thankful to have someone like her in my life and proud to call her my sister. How did you hear? My parents phoned me and all I could think of was just, I need to be with them now. And of course, it's at least a 26 hour flight away. So just dealing with the shock, packing a bag, It was the longest flight, as you could imagine. You have to refuel at Hong Kong. Getting off at Hong Kong, going to the, the lounge, and then uh, somebody at the lounge says, uh, there's a film crew here. They're, they're trying to get an interview with you. And I, 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 they could see I was in such shock. And I said, can, can you please just... Get me to the plane without having to speak to them because I haven't spoken to my sister yet. I've spoken to my parents. She's in shock. I can't speak to anyone before I speak to her. That's insane. So we 
got on, you know, those, those buggies that go through the airport with the beep, beep, beep. We're going through the airport. This film crew chasing me. And then I got on the plane. So, and then arrived in Melbourne. There's, I don't know, three rows deep, the whole way across the front of the family house, people with cameras trying to find out what's going on. There's what we call a nature strip in, in front of your house, the bit of grass. There's a satellite dish. That freaked me out more than anything. And all I wanted to do was go inside the door of the family home and see my gorgeous sister and hug her. And it was just like trying to get through all of these barriers And it took a little while to understand. All of that was there because everybody loves Kylie and they just wanted to know, is she okay? But as a family member trying to be a sister, a brother, a mother, a father, it made everything more difficult. Cut forward to three days later in trying to get to the hospital and Kylie's going to be operated on and our fears and thoughts and everything, there's another satellite dish outside the hospital. Not only was it obstructing us, but other patients, nurses and doctors with other people's lives that they need to get on with. At that point, I have to say it made me angry. Yes, it's going on. Yes, you want to know what's going on. But please let her get on with it so she can get better and let other people in the hospital... I just didn't think that was fair on them. What was, what was the first thing you said to Kylie when you saw her? I don't even remember. It was just a blur, but it was more about just giving her a hug and supporting her. I mean, she was scared. And being there for my parents too, because at the time I just thought, however scary this is for all of us, I think it's, it's got to be the hardest for the parents. It's got to be. She had to have an operation three days later. That must have been a horrendous three days for your family. Mm. What, what recollections do you have of that period before she could actually have the surgery? I think anybody who's been through cancer or know anyone who has been through cancer, in those three days, there is so much medical information to absorb. And it's always your decision what, how you, what treatment you take. And you've got to absorb all of that information first. So we had all of that going on as well as trying to keep everyone else out to have some private time to work out what's, what's the best treatment, who would be doing it, how it would happen, all of that. And that's anyone going through it. That's, that's, that's their three very, very tough days. When she had the operation, what are your memories of the immediate aftermath of that? We're just waiting at the hospital to see if she came out okay. And then you knew it was on to the next step. It's, it's a big process having cancer from one thing to the next to the next. And it's not, it's not as easy as just one operation and it's done. Um, so at that point, you just go into a mode where you get through this minute, this hour, this day and try and deal with everything that's thrown at you. And she's just the most brave little thing. It's extraordinary. What was good about this terrible situation was it did bring the pair of you closer together, didn't it? I think you just, you, you just go to another depth, I would call it, rather than closeness, a depth of um, 
you find strength within yourself that you never thought you had because you never needed it before. Were there periods when you as a family feared she wouldn't make it? No. Never thought of it. Couldn't. You don't. You just refused to? Refused. Can't. What was it like the day when she got the all clear? Well, there's the all clear and then there's the all, all clear as anyone who's been through cancer knows. You get the, it's all clear now from the operation, it's all clear now from the chemo. You get the, it's all clear gone. Then you get your six months all clear, your one year all clear. And the big year, the, 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 the proper one is the five year all clear. We're not there yet. But it's looked good so far, hasn't it? It looks incredible and... You know, she's just been so strong and in my head nothing's going to come back because it's just not going to happen. It must have been even harder for you, obviously, that one of your closest friends at the same time got cancer as well. Yeah, my, my, my best mate, um, who's the same age as me, um, got cancer and um, as my friend described before it was just all around me and dealing with um, my sadness and my shock for her at the same time people I didn't know would stop me in the street and just grab me and go isn't it wonderful your sister's better and it's all gone and I kind of I just I couldn't even breathe what am I going to say to these people it's not all gone it's here again and now my friends got it and I just I just I couldn't speak I couldn't couldn't do anything and that's that's at the point where I had a lot of Botox I remember going in to see this woman and saying just do something so that I don't have to see the hurt on my face. It's bad enough dealing with it. But just do something. And that was my one thing that I needed to to get up every day and get on with the day because it was tough. And your friend died of cancer. Yeah. And it's, it's still something that I'm dealing with. And you have good days and you have bad days. But her her situation was a lot different um, to Kylie's. And, um, yeah, she went into hospital and she was there for three months. um, And I went in almost every day. And then she didn't come out. Devastating. Um, some people win the battle, others don't, and you just throw your hands up in, in towards the sky and just go, "Why?" And I guess the biggest thing is trying to learn that in life, you sometimes just have to accept things. And. Some days I can and some days I still don't. I just say I don't get it and I'm angry and upset. I just don't get it. And it, it's, it's been around me, you know, with a lot of friends and the only way I can make sense of it is to try and... try and cope with my own feelings but to do something to help other people um, I'm working incredibly hard with a charity in Australia that Olivia Newton-John set up to rebuild a hospital that's in a very old outdated building, we want a new one there that is built specifically to treat people with cancer and hopefully not only can we help people that are going through it but there's 
um, an institute that's going to be just above the treatment, trying to find a cure. And they actually said to me last time I went back, they think they're really close. That would, that's the dream. A couple of weeks ago, you got caught up in a right old firestorm. The audience is like... <gasps> After Kylie's given the initial all clear, you get more good news when you are made a judge on a show called Australia's Got Talent. I mean, I have to say, I mean, don't take this the wrong way, but I've seen the Australian show, and they are, apart from you, a very odd-looking bunch. (laughs) When you watch Britain's Got Talent, say, how do you think it compares the Australian show? It's a completely different ball game and for the fact that we don't have that history of kind of vaudeville and performing at the end of the pier and the whole show's beauty is that it's just such a mixture of the good, the bad, the ugly, the mad and the wonderful and... and that, that's just the panel, look. <laughs> <laughs> now, it wasn't just Australia that was impressed by your performances as a judge, it was also Simon Cowell. Danny might have made it as a judge on Australia's Got Talent, but becoming a success in Britain was going to be an altogether tougher ask. You know, Danny really had to come into it and prove who she was and kind of prove her worth. Right from her X Factor debut, her critics were out to get her. Some people thought, why has she got the job? People always assume that she hasn't done as much as her sister, so there's that assumption that maybe her sister should be the judge. And to make matters worse, not everyone on the show welcomed her with open arms either. You can look at it as it was a desperate measure from an older woman who was not as attractive as the younger woman that's come in. It's like being the new girl at school, isn't it? And then one of the big girls comes along and, you know, puts you in your place. After that eventful series, Sharon decided to leave. When Cheryl joined the show, suddenly the press all jumped on and said, oh, you know, Danny's going to hate it because, you know, Cheryl's younger and pretty. And Danny was like to me, I don't care who it is, (laughs) as long as it's not Sharon. But the arrival of Cheryl only seemed to add to the pressure on Danny, and everything came to a head during an on-screen bust-up with fellow judge Louis Walsh over a choice of song. And Danny, you did lick their song, but it doesn't matter. They were fantastic. No way. I, we work on a rota system. We get first pick they a song every week. They have wanted to do Rule the World from day one. Danny. I don't get right, guys, song. it's going to get the spoke into recrimination. There was a fight, and, and it kind of spilled out on camera. Next into the spotlight, the overs again, and Danny. Who's up, Dan? It's horrible when you see any of your friends cry, so you do want to run up and give them a hug and make sure they're okay. I felt broken, to be quite honest. I I hate seeing Danny upset for whatever reason. It it wasn't just one thing. I think it was a build-up of everything, you know, throughout the series, throughout what has been written in the paper. It was was just a real tough time at work for, for that year. This season, she's finally put her troubles behind her and has been voted the most popular judge on the programme. This year, with Danny, I'm not quite sure why everybody has just cottoned on to something that I knew all along. And I find it really annoying when everybody's like, wow, Danny this year, isn't she brilliant? I'm like, she always was, (laughs) you know? I think it's nice that she's finally getting the the recognition and the, the credit that she deserves. One episode from last year, I'd never watched that one back where I was crying. I just couldn't. So I was a bit shocked to see that. Why did you lose it then, do you think? It sounds so stupid now when you look at it and it was all over, who stole a song? (laughs) But at the time, like Chris said, it was just a build-up of everything. And I just felt like within my character, it's so much about what is right and wrong. I don't care about bad headlines or someone having an opinion of me, but saying something that isn't true that I wouldn't do is something I do get upset about. of all the people in the world 
to be upset with. Louis Walsh Louis would be Walsh. about the last person. I mean, he's probably probably the nicest man on the planet. He wasn't nice those few weeks, I tell you. <laughs> there were some colourful words coming out of my dressing room backstage. When you first joined the judging panel, it was a fairly yeah. controversial appointment. Now, Noel Gallagher even said, if there's one person in the room who wouldn't know talent if it kicked them in the arse, it's Danny Minogue. <laughs> what did you feel oh, when you heard him say that? I was surprised he knew who I was. <laughs> but there are a lot of um, articles written to say why does she have the right to be there? And, and I kind of just said to everyone, I agree with you. I don't know if I can do this, but it's an ace job. And I'll just have a go and see what happens. And if I'm no good, get rid of me. There were, to put it mildly some tricky moments when you first came on the show and with Sharon Osbourne in particular and I interviewed Sharon in this very hot seat and Which I know, I've never seen I know by you've the never way. seen this <laughs> clips of that but you're about to show me uh, so because you missed it <laughs> we thought we'd show you a few of the of the highlights I mean, do you want to replay. do you want to see this yeah go on okay Let's clear it up once and for all, because I'm sure everyone here, like me, wants to know. What, what's the truth about why you left X Factor? I left X Factor because of Daddy Minogue. Why? Um, I, I didn't enjoy working with her at all. What you're saying is it was a very real conflict between you. You really hated each other. See, I didn't hate her because hatred is very close to love. It takes a lot of emotion. And I don't have that time for her. I just, she'd just dismiss her. She's like an insect. She was like a, an insect, a mosquito. You know when you're on holiday and you keep bloody itching it and you're going, oh, it go away. <laughs> what is your reaction to that? Uh, you know what? I was so wanting... <laughs> to meet Sharon when I got to be on the show. I'd watched the Osbournes, I'd watched all the X Factor. I was a massive fan. And it couldn't have been more devastating to turn up day one at work and it was pretty obvious she didn't want me there and I didn't know why. And then it was just ups and downs from then throughout the season and I tried with her because on paper it looked like fun. Working with Sharon Osborne, yes! <laughs> Reality, tiptoeing around, um, it, was, it was tough at times and I, I hate to think that someone who was the massive star of the show left because of me. The dynamic of the panel completely changed. I mean, Simon was suddenly flirting with you and you were much younger and you were pretty and all the rest of it. I could see why that would unsettle Sharon. I think it unsettled all of them and I think that was the point. I didn't want to upset people, but it was to shake the show up in general and it did. It provided that pantomime that was beyond real. What do you feel about Sharon now? I admire a lot of things that she's achieved. I don't always admire the way she behaves. And I always wanted to meet Ozzy Osbourne, but I guess that's out of the question. <laughs> <laughs> How competitive are you personally, do you think? You see, on X Factor now, you are a ruthless competitive machine, aren't you? Ruthless! I asked Simon, I said, who's, who's the most competitive? He went, oh, my God, Danny. He said, she's unbelievable. It unbelievable. is not! I think Simon and Louis are the most competitive, but they're jealous that I work hard with my artists and I have a close bond with them and all of that other stuff that I do. So you come out with all this guff about I'm comp I, I work with my artists, I, I made the best one win and all that kind of thing. Underneath it, you're thinking, I want to screw Carl and Walsh into the ground. And I want them to land on Cheryl Cole, right? <laughs> no! Yes! No! When, be honest here, when Cheryl Cole was announced as the new judge. Yeah. What the press latched onto very quickly 
must have been what was also a fear of yours, which is Simon up to his old tricks. He brings in this much younger, very pretty pop star, plonks her next to him. That You're getting the Sharon treatment. He's being mischievous again. I think there was uh, some hope or wish that I would turn into Sharon and rip off the eyelashes and the shoes and start <laughs> swearing and walk out of the studio, but it's just not me. Would you say you're good friends or not really? I say we work colleagues. She's gorgeous. She's adorable at work. She is what you see on the TV. That's genuinely her. But I don't have her phone number. We don't call each other. We don't hang out. But I don't hang out with the other judges either. You normally are the consummate professional. And then a couple of weeks ago, you got caught up in a right old firestorm when you made your joke about Daniel Johnson. I had read his interview that had explained that he was happily, openly bisexual. And that was him. And he wanted people to just accept him as he is, which I do. We were joking about it offset before the show went up and it just carried on to onset. And I guess because of the world that I live in, in and the kind of friends I have, I'm, I'm comfortable talking about those things. It kind of opened a can of worms when Simon reacted the way that he did. I then realised... Oh, not everybody read the article. So then they didn't get the joke. The whole room stopped. And everyone just went... (gasps) And And then I knew, I could see this hand, the corner of my eye, this hand come over. (laughs) And then I heard the voice, watch! (laughs) And then you could feel the next reaction from the audience. It's like... (gasps) Um, It was... Terrible. And at that point, you just want to go, rewind. Um, And when you told the joke again, or explained it again... He made me say it again, but by then it wasn't a joke, was it? It was like... uh, And I felt like I was in the principal's office. Yes. But what I was trying to (laughs) say was just... And... Did you think you might might lose your job? I knew that there were complaints, and they were kind of mounting by the minute, but... If you, if you can lose your job over, over that when it wasn't outing someone, I, I, I would have been surprised. Russell Brand tried it on with you, didn't he? Yeah, it was creepy. What did you feel? <laughs> Nothing. What do you look for in a man? If I look back over my life, my boyfriends have been all completely different. You're quite bossy as a girlfriend, do you think? Um, I don't know that I'm bossy. (laughs) Um, High maintenance? You know what they say, high maintenance thinks she's low maintenance, probably really high maintenance. (laughs) um, I, I like to be protected, but I like to, you know... Have my own mind and be and be strong. Russell Brand tried it on with you, didn't he? Yeah, it's creepy. What did you feel? <laughs> Nothing. Really? <laughs> He's supposed to be the world's sexiest Lothario, you know, irresistible. I think some girls find him sexy, but it wasn't me. And he actually genuinely slipped you the number. I was a guest on his show, leaving the show in the corridor. He's there going kind of going and doing his very you know, <laughs> funny routine. And uh, then he gives me his number, to which I just go, thanks, and leave the building and, you know. You threw it away? Yeah. How quickly? Very quickly. (laughs) It's not been easy for you on the romance front, but things are finally looking up. Danny's fame has spanned four decades, and she's never looked better. You can choose a time in your life to blossom. And I think she's just on the right part of her life now. And that's great. Danny's very, in a very, very good place at the minute. She's very happy. After a string of failed romances, Danny found herself aged 36 and single. But waiting for her in a nightclub in Ibiza was a model called Chris. When I first met Danny, I actually didn't know who she was. Chris is 
so unintimidated by Danny's celebrity status? The first thing I said was, hi, nice to meet you, but I had to say that about three times. One, the music, and two, was the language barrier. What he's done for her is just give her a perspective on her life. I've been called every name under the sun by my friends. They've, uh, they've called me the luckiest man alive. He was just that missing little piece of the puzzle that she needed, and now it's just been tapped in, and she's just this complete picture. She's the one. I've never felt like this before. I'm absolutely thrilled for her. It's just, just feels like it's meant to be. It's right. I was brought up around children, so I'm, I'm really keen to have children, but the answer I get back is, well, if you can go through the nine months and you can have the babies, then yeah, I'm in. I mean, how hard can it be? <laughs> Sounds like somebody's getting a bit broody there, Danny. I need a little convincing. Sounds like a lot to go through. It's, it's... It's never been part of my world. I've never been maternal. I've never been one of those girls that says, by this age, I'm going to have this many kids. And I almost thought I was going to kind of escape it, just take a wide berth and go around it all. And um, now it's kind of, I'm in a relationship that is just so right. Maybe I have to start thinking about it. What's interesting about Chris is that he's, he's not famous at all. Is that part of what attracted you to him? No, it's just him. Him with fame or without fame or being a celebrity or not being a celebrity, he would always be the same guy and he's just grounded and down to earth and oh, my friends and family love him, I love him, I love his family and it just, it all works. And he is, I mean, he's a bit of a toy boy. I don't like the word toy boy because it sounds like somebody you're just playing with. You're, for me, you're 38, he's 30. But for me, he's my man. He's so man. He so looks after me. He's not my little plaything. He says you're the one. He knows it. Is he the one for yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. Are you going to marry him? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I guess he'd have to ask me, wouldn't he? <laughs> what would you say if he did? I'd want him to be the first person to hear the answer, not you. <laughs> Does it feel nice that you've reached a place in your life where you found true love in your private life and actually you've become truly loved by the British public. I'd be happy enough just even with the first one just to have found true love. I could honestly walk away from all of the performing if it's something that I wasn't good at and people didn't like seeing me do it. But to have both come together at once is just... <laughs> Incredible. And if I was a betting man, would you think worth a few quid on within a year, married with baby? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> would it be a nice way for the, the fairy tale to end, do you think? I don't want the fairy tale to end. I want it to begin. This is the beginning for me. Would it be a nice way for the fairy tale to begin? I think there's some things, <laughs> and I've revealed a lot tonight, that are just between me and Chris. And <laughs> as time goes on, we'll see what happens. Ladies and gentlemen, Danny Mimos. Tomorrow at 8, Lily and Rufus are trying to get married as quickly as possible in Brand New Gossip Girl. The next night, it's Heist sequel, Ocean's 12.